So today we're going to be running through this kind of Paris Catacombs inspired wall material I wanted to build. I originally had decided to build this to kind of get into the spooky season at the end of October and was going to release it on the day, on October 31st. Um, but life got in the way, stuff had to get delayed, so instead we're releasing it in the traditionally spooky season of deep November where there's already Christmas stuff on the shelves. So maybe a little out of season, but I think it will still be really useful. This material can look very complicated when you see it. If we look at the graph, it still looks complicated, but we're going to go through this and just give a you know top level overview of all the decisions I made. I think it'll be really helpful. You'll be able to find all the different little, especially the interesting little tricks I did. I'm going to highlight specifically. If you are an intermediate substance designer user, you've been using it for a year, a couple of years, maybe you'll probably be able to get everything you need to get from just this video, kind of the top level overview of it. It's also just the case that this is not useful for just if you are going to be making a skeleton wall. If there's other stuff you want to make, there's a lot for you in here. Just general substance designer stuff. We go through a ton of the warps, a ton of the blurs, obviously a lot of tile generation. We go through making the whole albedo map, the whole roughness map. So this is generally applicable to all sorts of materials you would want to make. It is not for just making a skeleton wall, but it is a really good exercise to run through all those things. If you are newer to substance design, or you just want a bit more of a handholdy approach to this, which I understand because a lot of tutorial content out there can be very either time lapsey or just showing you a completed thing. And that can be helpful, especially if you have some skill already, some knowledge, you're able to kind of pick that out better. But if you're newer, that can be really hard to follow. I'm very familiar with that feeling. It's very frustrating when someone's just jumping around a ton and you want kind of an entire approach. So on the Patreon, I've included a actual real time rebuild of this entire material node by node. I'm explaining why I'm choosing the nodes I'm using. I'm explaining what they do specifically. And often there's like a little sidebar where I pull to the side and show it on a more simpler context. So you can understand that node outside of its application, this direct material. So that's exhaustive. I was looking at the video yesterday and it totals eight hours of content. So there's a ton in there. It's exhaustive because I feel compelled to kind of show every step and exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. So if you're more interested in that, you can go support me on the Patreon, you can get access to that. It's gonna be in parts because it's just huge, it's massive, so you wanna see it in these different steps, kind of height map, working through all the interesting height stuff we have going on here, eventually getting to the color and roughness, and just walking you through the thought process um, of this entire graph. But for now, we'll do that kind of brief overview, all the highlights, so let's get to the graph. So just jumping into this main graph here, you can feel a little overwhelmed because it seems like there's a lot going on in there and there is, and but that doesn't necessarily mean it's complicated, right? A lot of like complexity comes from just seeing a lot of relatively simple components just stacked one on top of each other. So if you actually look and examine the individual parts, it's, it's really not all that bad. And a lot of good texturing, I feel, kind of follows the same approach where it's a lot of little subtle things that are quite simple on their own stacking together to create that kind of complexity. One thing we'll talk a lot about is the concept in all my videos, we mentioned this, but the concept of working from big to small is like really, really important. It's it's much easier to kind of wrap your head around like the small individual elements to focus on just the skulls or just the cobbles or just this background mortar or just the pebbles and then layer them on um, intelligently as you go. So this is the main graph here you'll see in Explore where we kind of assemble everything and do a lot of the texturing work. But there's a bunch of little subgraphs here that are kind of helpers that build layers or certain elements for us. So this is the mortar layer. And all this thing does, you can see is the other graph kind of faded away there. This is just where we build all of that base stone because this takes up so much of the material. It really is kind of our backdrop. So we want it to be kind of its own element. We'll kind of slowly build it up from there. But about that complication, looking at this, this can also seem quite complicated on its own. But we need to break that down into smaller, simpler elements we can handle. So what we're actually starting with here is a tile sampler that is sp spreading, just a more advanced tile generator, and it's just spreading around all of these actual individual sections, right? So again, we're just kind of working down to this, the simple shape and adding that complexity as we go. So this graph actually is a shape unto himself over here. This just makes this kind of sloped shape here that we're going to use to stack on top of each other to make that mortar layer. 
there's some fun stuff in here. For example, I didn't, I wanted to start with a kind of an interesting shape, but I didn't want to start with a polygon. A, it's too symmetrical. So I may, I wanted to pick like maybe seven sides, but the problem is that each segment, like length segment here on the sides, the edges, I guess, are all the exact same length, which doesn't feel great. I'd like it to feel a bit more organic. So we did this fun thing where I took a splatter circular. It's just a tile generator where everything orients towards the middle and in the center. And I made a square and I set the radius to 0.5 so that they start right at the edge of the, the border of the texture and I actually turn tiling for this one off. This is kind of a fun trick. And I didn't want 10, I want seven or eight or whatever. And if you scale this up in X so that they meet, you have an octagon or heptagon, I guess, because we have seven sides. We increase the Y width and then add some Y random. We get this nice kind of oblong shape, which is really cool. And to only isolate the middle shape, we had to make a flood fill because we get these little bits and bobs here on the edges where it crosses the tile boundary. It doesn't work that great. But if we run that into a flood fill to grayscale and just give it a single kind of white square in the middle, only this cell will sample a color at all because everything else out here is just going to sample the black. So we only isolate him. Then we just blur it, histogram scan it. Maybe that was just kind of taking the corners off because they were a little too sharp. I didn't like that so much. So we're blurring it, histogram scanning it to round them out, beveling it, which usually we set to full intensity. I'm just to fully close the bevel and then we blurred it a bit, auto leveled it, and directionally warped it to sort of break up that shape a little bit. Scan the top, and this is like basically that first shape layer we want, where we have a bit of a more, like without that directional warp. It's a lot less interesting, because we just have the exact polygon. This directional warp breaks that up a bit, adds kind of more interest to the edge. And importantly, we had to take a gradient and sort of min that to slice the top off so that we create darkness at the bottom of the the shell and white at the top so that we're able to stack these using a max blending mode in the other graph so we jump to the mortar layer and this just has a bunch of that same graph right you can just drag that slice in here and if we randomly seed this graph we have like functionally unlimited amounts of these now in practice we're just using six and that seems fine we're just spreading these all around using a tile sampler, giving some random position, some random rotation, a bit of random luminance, some scale random, just to make them all a little different. We also put on some like symmetry random as well to, to flip some side upside down, right side up. You can see on so the tile generator, if you change the symmetry random, you're flipping them. And that just helps us get more variations out of those just six shapes we have. So it lets us to get... Um, a bit more variety without having to see the repetition so obviously but even if we did see a lot of repetition so i'm going to bring a quick level node here just so we can step through the graph as we go like this this actually looks pretty cool already and it's actually not super easy to see the repetition you, you if you squint you can you can definitely see it but the next stages in this graph all involve kind of breaking that up a bit more. So we did another version of them where we tiled them more. We have more of them here and they're a bit shorter, a bit longer. And we actually just subtract this away from the original shape or with a min blending mode to add this kind of secondary level of detail. Right? So these are very similar. Just with some, some slight changes to the amount of them. And that adds this like second layer of height here. A lot of what you're doing in designer when you're doing this stuff is just like I mentioned, like adding additional layers of detail, working from low frequency shapes, right? So shapes that don't occur very often, like these guys are a good example. They only occur, you know, maybe six times horizontally and six times vertically. There's very few of them, but they're very large, right? So they're low frequency, high scale, or very big. And then we're slowly moving to a more frequent noise, right? It occurs more often now. That's probably about 14 by 14 or something like that. And they're smaller. So that kind of creates an additional layer of complexity here where we're breaking up that big shape into kind of smaller components, but still keeping that. A lot of what we're dealing with here is the balance between different frequencies and scales of noise. We didn't like how perfect these looked, so we start looking to things like slope blurs to just break up the edges more. Right, so this is gonna blur the input texture. 
along a provided slope mask. So this was just some crystals we piled around and kind of blended into each other to make this really sharp map. We ended up like vector morphing this as well to just add some additional breakup. The vector morph is a fun node. This is just going to, it's a bit more complicated than a normal warp. It allows you to move separately in X and Y. Functionally, you will often plug a normal map into this um, to create that warp. It just allows you to warp in multiple directions at the same, uh, with, with one warp, essentially. Auto level it because we always we've been doing so much blending here. You'll see me do this a lot. We've done enough blending here that we're losing a bunch of range. If you were to look at the histogram for this image, you'll see that it's quite narrow. So putting that into the auto level is nice just to get back that full range and make sure that all the math we do subsequent to this has a lot more uh, ability to move along with it. From here, we just made some more noises. This one actually was kind of interesting because we built a random grayscale out of the curvature of our existing height map, right? So we made a height map, made a curvature of it, turned it, or sorry, made a normal map, turned it into curvature, scanned it to try to get the outlines of the stones. This one isn't perfect for sure, but at least gives us this kind of fun breakup so we can lay on this extra surface detail. It is pretty subtle. But it makes a big difference going from something like this to here. We're just adding more surface detail and adding these kind of fun, interesting breakups, getting a bit more high frequency, a bit more low scale, right? They're getting smaller. And then the rest is just slowly adding more detail on top, right? Adding these more, more plane changes here. What I'm doing here is just taking these the cells one and subtracting it from this. You can see if we had this really intense, it's really strong. But this does a good job of just adding additional plane changes, right? Where the surface normal alters its orientation slightly. The cells one is really good for that. Down here, I actually do this thing that we're going to do a lot in this, in this uh, graph. Instead of making a brand new interesting rock noise here to lay on top, right? To add additional detail, I'm actually just grabbing the same like the same uh, texture up till that point, zooming out of it a little, rotating it a bit, and I'm laying it back on over top. It's really subtle, but if we had it really intense, you'll see. The nice thing about doing this is it's a bunch of free detail. We don't really have to work super hard to make this kind of rocky noise. Like a lot, you could use like a cloud here, right? And it'd be kind of boring because... I think it's a lot of people's go-tos use like clouds and moisture noises, and I definitely do. I use a lot of them. But the interesting thing with doing this is the noise we're using, this kind of zoomed out version of the base texture, it's tied to the base material, right? Like it, it is more related to this one because it is it. So when we use it to subtract it from itself, the noise has this ability to kind of be a bit more coherent with the layer underneath it. Right, there's they're more married together, so you don't all of a sudden have this really different noise being laid in. The there's a bit of harmony between the two layers. They they look like they belong with each other more. You'll see me do this kind of thing a lot throughout this graph. Now we're getting into really high frequency noise, right? So really small details that happen a lot. So I'm using a black and white spot too here. Doing this fun trick, you'll see me do a lot, where I just want to like sort of inflate that noise because it's looking a little too small. So if you take a slope blur and blur these at like a really low intensity because they're so small to begin with and put this through a slope blur on kind of high samples, also low intensity, you can get this cool effect where you're just sort of inflating these little shapes so that they're a bit more round, a bit more cartoony is the wrong word, but they're definitely more simple. They're not as noisy. And sometimes that can be just the trick. So just making this noise, laying that on, you can see we get this jump where we start adding all of this much higher frequency noise. And if you're paying attention, you can definitely still see those original big shapes, but we're starting to see more lower frequencies, or some more higher frequencies, that details a bit bigger, and slowly working our way to really high frequency with a lot of, um, uh, it happens very often, almost per pixel at this point. It's very frequent, really, really tiny. But we're going to actually keep doing that. We, do, I did the same trick here where I just zoomed out from that noise we had already used. 
right? Did a high pass here. The reason I'm doing the high pass, but all the, all this chain does is add even more little detail. You'll see me use the high pass a lot too. And this has to do with kind of controlling the scale and frequency of detail through a texture. Because if you had a cloud, this has a bunch of different scales and frequencies, right? There's some really big details that are relatively low frequency. They don't actually occur that often, right? Like big white blob here, big dark blob, big white blob, stuff like that. If you put this through a high pass, it's going to take out those low frequencies. And because it tends to make things more gray here when it does that, I usually have an auto level after it. You'll see this, this exact chain, but with you know this noise swapped out a lot in this graph. So this high pass, the lower you bring it, the, the less you see of those big shapes and it emphasizes the small frequencies of the noise. Right? So if I just go to the high pass and put it up really high, here you can just really see all these big, huge, billowy shapes, right? It's really obvious. Or we can pass those low frequencies out and really emphasize the high frequency. So this is something you'll see me do just all over the place in that, like almost in that exact configuration over and over just getting even smaller right that's the name of the game here is just slowly getting smaller smaller more and more frequent and we don't need because we know we're going to do a ton of texturing in the graph after now we're getting really tiny almost like white noise right because we're getting a whole other graph to texture in it's not necessarily the case that I need to worry so much about doing a ton of texturing in this graph because in the main graph we'll do all sorts of extra stuff to add additional noise here and make it more interesting but it definitely is the case here that it helps to have the a, a solid amount of texture done in this layer and, and I think this worked well so with that we'll hop into the main graph okay so now we're in this graph this is where we're assembling everything. And I've actually just turned the albedo off so we can focus on just the height map as we're stepping through stuff here. And I'm going to take this node, this dot node. These are really cool. You can get these by just searching dot node, believe it or not. But what's really neat about these is now you actually in designer have the ability to do named reroutes. So you can, they call them portals, but it's the same way. If you're familiar with that in any other system, you'll, you'll have seen stuff like this. But this is fun because you can put this here and call this something like edge detect mask. The name doesn't matter. It's just for you. And what's cool is another dot node elsewhere in the graph. We have a ton of them. But that will now be pickable. And that node is connected to each other. There is a, a wire between them, but the portal makes that invisible. And that's really nice because you won't have all this stuff kind of spread through the graph, straddling everything, having a bunch of noodles flying everywhere. It gets really annoying. And this helps things just stay kind of clean and legible. So you'll see me, these are kind of everywhere. So I'm just going to make another portal mode here called temporary height. And the reason I'm doing this is just so that we can go step by step like what we were doing in the other graph. So I'll make a dot node down here called temp height as well so they're connected and run all of our height map stuff to here so we can just see what stage we're working at this was just the initial shape of the cobblestones these edge detect from here it was pretty simple to just bevel these right take that our our edge mask here bevel it all auto level it because often you know setting that bevel to full intensity is just going to kill a bunch of the range so we auto level it to get it all back. And this at least creates that initial roundness to the cobblestones. And then we move the level gray to inflate them, right? Originally, this is way back at the beginning. And we wanted them to be more rounded. So we push that gray level out in order to round out the cobblestones some more. And from there, it was just adding more detail. So this is mostly just breaking up the edges so they're a bit more interesting. And this is just stuff like taking I wanted to make a flood fill of where the cobblestones are that was really accurate so you'll see me do this a lot too using uh, curvature we did that in our video um, where we were explaining how to make like good flood fill mask so it's taking the cobbles making a norm map from them making a curvature map 
and then just grabbing the black cracks in between and using those for our flood fills. And these will be nice and really follow the exact shape of the cobblestones. Random grayscale, close it up with a distance. And then we're just using this to separate these noises because I don't want to lay the noise on just over top. Because the problem with doing it that way is you can actually have situations where you can see the noise on either side of the cobbles, right? So this cobble and this cobble both have this chunk taken out of it, which doesn't make a ton of sense. Like they shouldn't work like that. So I need to separate this noise so that each cell has a different part of that, that Gaussian noise we're using to plug into the slope floor. So I've just taken a directional warp, set it to a really high value. And the intensity input is that flood filter random grayscale. So this cell will move the noise a lot more than the cell next to it. And the result is they sort of tear apart. And this does a good job of separating stuff like this so it doesn't happen. We don't necessarily see something happen to this stone also happen right to the stone adjacent, which just feels unnatural, doesn't make any sense. So you'll see me do that kind of thing a lot too. Often as we're laying on these noises, you'll see me use a vector morph or a directional warp to sort of pull that noise apart into multiple sections so that we, we avoid that kind of uh, connecting uh, or that that look of you're plastering one noise over top of another. They should have a bit more of an intelligent way of blending. Same thing here, just additional blurs. And you can tell just like in our mortar graph, we're adding slope blurs and warps and blends here at the exact same in the exact same kind of um, philosophy where we're starting from really big noises, right, that are relatively low frequency and adding higher frequency noises. Right, so things that are a lot more repetitive, a lot smaller, or not repetitive, but they happen, the shapes happen more often, and they're uh, smaller scale. We're doing the exact same thing here, right? No surprises here. The next blend we're doing here is really high frequency. Right, so again, it's that layering effect. And these are all, these noises could be anything really. Um, again, in the Patreon walkthrough, like you'll see exactly why I'm deciding on these, but they could be whatever. The big important thing to take away here is that I'm working from these big shapes down to the small shape. This was just adding some slopes to the cobblestones because before they were a little too perfect. They kind of look like they're like uh, bread baking in the oven, right? They have this kind of perfect roundness to them. Multiplying on some random gradients, right? So this is that same flood fill and you'll see I'm using that portal node to grab that flood fill from earlier so that we don't need to have that wire just stretching all over the place, making the graph really hard to read. This does a flood filled random gradient. I spread those gradients around. And then this just tilts them all a little. So some cobblestones are kind of sloped from left to right, some top down. It just adds a lot more variety to those kind of initial simple cobblestone shapes. Same thing here, auto leveling it to get the range back. And then this is doing something similar where it's just making some cobbles lower than others. Right, so some of those cobblestones actually um, uh, are pushed further down because they're getting darker. We have a flood filled random grayscale here with just a multiply. So some stones get pushed back, some stones stay relatively high. And you can tell the difference between when we blended on the gradients and the random grayscales is really significant. Right here, they're all really uniform, like I said, little pizza pockets in the microwave. Thanks, mom. And then this does a ton to add variety to it. It's, it's really helpful. In this little section here, you see I'm often using these frame nodes. You can select any group of nodes and hit frame. And you can call this something, right? So I don't know what you would call this here, but whatever, noise one. I like doing this kind of thing. You'll see me use this all over the place because it helps me find my way around the graph later. If I need to go back and look at stuff or if I'm going to share it with someone, they know what I did. Right? And like I said, on the Patreon version where you actually have the graph, Having these little sections is really helpful for people to follow along. And like I mentioned, it's, it's helpful for me to follow along because me in three months when I open this graph to remember what I did, if I was like, oh, yeah, something in that catacomb material was cool. I wish I remember how to make it. I don't want to open this up in six months and be like, what did I do? Right. So having some sort of uh, note structure here is really helpful. This is just the all we're doing in this section is adding more detail to the rocks. So slowly adding additional noise, right? Blending in some really lumpy, bumpy noises, adding a lot more kind of 
crunchy, right? Lower frequency, higher scale. I wanted to add some real kind of divots. So we took a cloud, slope blurred it a bit. And I'm getting a history rim scan to just get these kind of like impacts almost like where this the stone's been scooped out by just like something striking it or piece falling off over time. So this is a pretty significant detail where we get these big kind of craters in the stone, which adds a lot of variety. It's just more interesting detail. And then these were fun because here there were these little, I saw in the reference, these sort of scrapes. They're not everywhere. But there, you can see them here. They're sort of like these anisotropic noises. Anisotropic meaning that the, the noise is just in one direction. Um, but I think that's really, yeah, like these scrapes are a really cool detail, I think. So to get those, we just built our own. I just used a tile generator to spread some kind of simplest, simple ish shapes around and then blended them with a parabola. So we were only isolating the middle and I just tile generated or I used a tile generator to tile these around just all over the place. Histogram scanned them just to get like the kind of the peaks of it and use these to subtract from the height map. And this adds these really fun scrapes that I think add like a really interesting, unique detail. A lot of the time when you're making height maps, roughness maps, it's a very similar thing where you're starting with more definitely lower frequency higher scale noises that are kind of generic. They just add like a base level of interest. That's what a lot of these things are doing. They're not really anything in particular. They're just these noises that add a base level of interest to the texture, whether it's a height map or roughness map, albedo map, same thing. But the further you go down, you're more likely to add like specific things that are observed from the reference. So like you can tell in the reference, we do have this kind of lumpy where things get a little higher, a little lower. It's kind of mashed potatoes, right? It's, it's really bumpy. That's what a lot of this stuff is, making these little bumps. And then those scrapes are the things we just built, right? So trying to find specific details and matching them up um, with the texture specifically in the designer uh, graph. Here, we're just adding some more really fine little pits, which are cool. And you'll see what I'm doing a lot. I even did it with the scrapes here too, is often what I'm doing is just you can really sum up a lot of stuff you're doing designer as take thing A, take thing B, blend them over each other in some way and use thing C as a mask. So in this case, this is thing A, right? The thing we've been working on just the cobblestone texture. This is thing B, those little spots, and I'm blending them over each other with I'm subtracting them in this case. But to make it more interesting, I just need some sort of noise as a mask so that this isn't the same intensity everywhere in the texture. The difference is subtle. If I delete this, right, this can feel bad when you do this over and over and over where things are just laid on at 100% opacity all over the place. It can get old and it can be a little too heavy handed too. So just breaking these up with some kind of noise really does help it feel more natural because things are less, um, uh, are less the same everywhere, right? It's less consistent. You'll have like areas that are a lot more damaged than others and You'll see me do that a lot. And often what I'm doing is just grabbing some kind of noise from earlier in the chain. So this same noise ended up making the, the little spots themselves. But if I take it and blur it a little and auto level it to get back that range, this is like an OK mask to sort of just plug into the opacity of that blend and modulate some of those spots. So some are stronger than others. And then this is even more like tiny little noises. Right, real, and this was by observation, looking at the reference, these tiny little pock marks. So we just build the thing, right? A lot of it is that simple. Observe your reference, find that detail you're interested in, build that detail, and then figure out how to blend it on. So that gives us all these little tiny specks. And again, there's some detail to mask it. You'll see me do that all the time. And that was it for the cobbles. Right after we just added some really high frequency, like a black and white spots too something to really uh, kind of chew the cobblestone up, make it really interesting, a lot of high frequency, small noise. After that, it was on to placing the skulls. So to do the skulls, I actually baked these from a model. You could make these in designer, really. Like it would have made that eight hour tutorial that's on the Patreon into an 80 hour tutorial that's on the Patreon. 
So just because you can make something procedurally, like we could do this, but it doesn't mean you should, because it's much quicker for me to just have these models, right? Sculpt them, whatever. I just have a couple orientations of them in Maya, Blender, whatever package you're using. And then I bake the height maps from them in Designer. Um, I just made a couple different orientations of them. Some of them lost their, some of them lost their mouth. Some of them lost some of their teeth. Um, but just to get a couple different versions, um, it's just easier to do it this way. Like you should use the right tool for the job. You don't necessarily have to make things procedural all the time. And we are still using it procedurally in a sense because we aren't in a traditional texturing workflow. You'd be like duplicating this model all over the place and putting it into the right place in your kind of cobblestone wall sculpt and baking it. There's like an intersection. Like what we're doing here is still procedural in the sense that we've made these kind of nine versions, just not in designer. And then we're going to uh, spread them everywhere. And the way we're spraying them everywhere is by using these Atlas splitter nodes. So these are really cool. If you ever worked with like scan data or something, you're probably familiar with these. But what it does is takes an atlas. You can kind of, you could refer to this as an atlas, right? It's just a, uh, you'll see this often with like pits of leaves or sticks and stones, like little things. It often happens with scan data. Um, you can pull these in. I'm going to put this into the height map. And it does a pretty good job. You also need an opacity map. So I just grabbed an opacity, like a histogram scan the height. And this does a good job. It just does some like value processor and flood fill stuff to just isolate each element. So you can see if we look at the height output, it just isolates one of them. And if you, you want to set the shape to auto crop, probably to just zoom it in. And then you can just move this shape selection to grab the different parts of the atlas. It's really handy. Doing this with a bunch of transforms could be really annoying. And this node is like a much nicer way of doing it. I really like it. Um, but yeah, it's you could do it else uh, in other ways. It would just be slower and a bit less nice to work with. I think this is feels better. But we just took these and set them all to a different shape selection. So this one, we just found the skulls we wanted, right, of all the different versions. And... Obviously, I could only pick six. You could pick an arbitrary amount of them, but I thought six would be fine. We can go into this in a different video, but you can take these, any of these nodes, like tile samplers, material transforms, whatever, and add an arbitrary amount of inputs. By default, they go to six. Um, I have like a tile generator that I'll use. Um, not for this graph, but I have used before. And when I need more than six inputs, right? So traditionally, a tile generator can only input uh, six. I just made this one 24 because I had some specific, I think it was like the squid pentacle ball thing I did ages ago. I needed a ton of different inputs. It may have been the koi. I'm not sure. And, and I've used it a lot since. But we just take these skulls and scatter them around in a tile sampler. The trick here is we don't want any of these to intersect with one another. So they're offset, but they don't have enough random position in them to really... Um, we don't want enough random, there's, you see this number is very low. I don't want this position high enough that they intersect with each other, right? This is a thing you deal with a lot with height maps and designers, having different elements kind of crash through each other when you have it set on max blending mode or something like that. You want to try to avoid that if at all possible. So I just have the position random on low enough that I know that it will do a good job scattering them, but that it won't cause them to ever intersect each other. And I've just added a little bit of rotation random, a little bit of luminance random. So some are um, darker than others, right? So they'll be pushed a bit further back than the other skulls. But that's basically it. Um, I also threw some symmetry random on, specifically just horizontal, right? Because you wouldn't want, I wanted the skulls to be, if we looked at the catacomb reference I was using, I didn't want the skulls to all of a sudden be flipped upside down. Right? They should all be kind of right set up because people have built this just putting them here. They, there shouldn't be one that's just like flipped. So in order to do that, if you just go to image input here, if you were to use symmetry random, we'll grab uh, a different height map just so we can see the whole skull, I think. Yeah. If you just go to any tile generator sampler or whatever and turn the symmetry random up, it's going to like flip some upside down, flip some horizontally. You can switch this to only horizontal or only vertical. So some look left, some look right. 
right? And this just gets more variety out of our six skull shapes. So instead of seeing the exact same skull over and over and over, sometimes he looks this way, sometimes he looks that way. And we just get more variety out of it that way. But we lay those skulls on and we did some detailing to them here. Not a ton though. This is just putting on some extra noise so that they don't look so um, clean, right? Because the model, I didn't want to, and this is more about how there's a procedural nature to the skulls, even though they weren't built in designer, right? I didn't want to sculpt a ton of broken noise, like a bunch of crunchy damage into the skulls themselves, because then you would see that, that same detail on that same skull over and over and over. So all of the damaged component, I'm making completely procedural in Substance Designer, right? All the little pits and uh, all the high frequency detail we're going to lay on here. I still want to keep that in Designer just so that this skull and this skull, even though they're the same uh, model, right? They've been baked from the same model. They have different damage on them, right? So you do want to leverage the tool, Substance Designer in this case, for what it's good at, right? And it is good at adding this kind of procedural layering on stuff. Um, it is not as good as making a shape like this from scratch. You can do it, but it's almost like using uh, a hammer to screw in a screw, right? You probably could make it work, but it'd be a real headache and it would take you forever, right? So you want to try to pick the right tool for the job. Maybe maybe one day we will build one of these together just as an exercise and you'd learn a lot. It's a good way of like figuring out how to blend different shapes together. So it's probably worth doing at some point. So we keep going here. We're just laying on more and more noise until we have these feeling... Uh, a lot more aged and weathered, right? They've been here for hundreds of years, just sitting down underground, getting old and beaten up and stuff like that. So over here, we're going to take... Um, I actually did this trick where I grabbed some of the noise that we had used on the cobblestones because I wanted them to have a similar surfacing to the cobblestones, but be able to change it a little bit as we went. So you can see this portal node here. This is actually just this is actually just taking, um, it's taking a bunch of detail from the cobbles up here. You'll see me use an RGBA merge node here, and this is just so that I can grab a bunch of the different noises we used on the cobblestone itself. So this was like the noise itself. This was its mass. This was the 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 noise itself. This was the mass it used, and I put that into an RGBA merge node and send it across. The only reason I'm doing this is so that I don't need to make a portal node for every single noise. I can blend these together and then out here, separate them again and just add them to the texturing as we go, which is great, really helpful. Right, so that now there's the cobblestones and the skulls at least have some of that similar pitting on them, but I might want to be able to tone it back a little bit on the skull or make it a bit more intense on the cobblestone and having it separated in this way is really helpful. So that's just making the cobbles and the stones. The interesting stuff is blending them into each other. So the way this is sort of a fascinating thing that I think is worth doing. What there's a lot of ways you could do this. What what we eventually arrive at is this guy. Where we have some cobblestones, some skulls. The interesting thing about it, what we want to do, right, is Looking at the reference, essentially, occasionally, the way the way the skull the keep saying I kept saying scobbles during the video too, and I'm sure I will keep saying it here. If you look at the skulls and the cobbles, it's usually the case that how it really looks is that occasionally a cobblestone is just replaced with a skull, right? If you were to just blend the cobblestone and the skulls together here, this really wouldn't work great. If I grab the final cobblestone and the final skull mask and blend these with like a max, they're just going to crash through each other, right? This this can look kind of bad, right? He's got like a stone for a hat. Doesn't work very well. What I wanted to do instead is say, hey, I'm going to take some of those cobblestones out and just replace them with a skull, more or less. So I did this fun trick here where I kind of need to do two things, right? The first thing I need to do is is to just take some cobblestones out. Right? So, or take some skulls out, rather, I suppose. So, what I thought I would do here is I took the flood fill mask of where the cobblestones are. I beveled it, auto leveled it, 
And so this just says, here's where the center of those cobblestones are. I histogram equalize them to just spread the values out and then scan them. And I'm actually using that as an input into the mask map of these skulls. And the reason I'm doing that is this gets rid of any skulls that appear at the intersection between cobblestones. So if I were to, I can show you here. This is what it looked like originally. And the problem with this is we can have cobblestones. I'll just grab the cobble height map. We can have skulls show up in between cobblestones, which isn't really helpful because what we want to do is re really replace a cobblestone with a skull. Um, and these ones that are right in the middle aren't super helpful for that. Now you could use like a flood fill to map or grayscale. I find it's a bit trickier to manage really. And it's not really the right thing for a shape this complicated, I think. So what I decided to do here is just say, hey, the first that we need to do is get rid of any skulls that happen not on cobblestones. They happen kind of in between because they're going to be more difficult to manage. So that's what this mask does. On the tile sampler, you have a mask uh, map input. So this will just turn off different uh, spawn points for these skulls based on the mask. So we plug this gradient in, we turn the mask map threshold up, and you'll see it'll start removing skulls from the black area of this mask map. And so if we use this as our mask, we're going to start removing skulls from the black spots here, and that's just the intersection between the cobblestones. So that's the first thing I did here was say, hey, let's get rid of any skulls that happen more or less at the intersections. Right, the, A couple might sneak through, and that's okay. We can increase the strength of this mask if we wanted to make it more selective. But for the most part, we do a pretty good job of saying, hey, there's either a skull or a cobble here. They're not really occurring in the in the middle, right? which is a lot easier for us to work with. Because what we do next is really simple. We just take where the skulls are. So this is our skull mask. right? This is where the skulls are. And we got this by just histogram scamming, histogram scanning. <laughs> the skulls themselves and just passing them into this mask. In this mask, we just blur it a little, histogram scan it to just expand them. You can use a threshold to make sure it's nothing but white or black. All the threshold does is set this to whatever value you want, right? Anything below a certain threshold becomes white or becomes black, whatever. So just make sure there's nothing other than white or black in this texture. We run that into a flood fill to grayscale. So again, this just takes our cobbles and fills the cobble up the color of the pixel beneath it. And I use this to subtract from that cobble. And what that does is anywhere there is a skull now, we cut away a cobble. We remove it. And then we just blend the skulls back on top, which works really, really nice. Um, I think it's a really great way of doing this. It's a lot quicker. Um, there's some, like I said, you can do this with a, a flood fill mapper as well, if you'd like. Um, but I find this one to be kind of the more effective of them, right? So we just had to isolate that. We had to just kind of think about it through in those steps, right? Remove the skulls from the intersections that don't occur on the cobbles. Then remove any time we have a skull, we want to remove that cobblestone and then where we removed it, we blend the skull back on top. So it's a little tricky. Again, in the Patreon video, you'll see me walk through it step by step. Um, but it's like a fun technique you can use to kind of do these swaps without relying on a flood fill map or grayscale, which does have its uses. Um, but I think would have been trickier there than, than I wanted to. I lost this guy a little bit while I was <laughs> talking there. So I'm going to make a bright magenta symbol here so I always know where he is. So after we had laid the skulls on, we wanted to do the same, just blend in that mortar, right? Put the background on. And you could just max these, right? Like take our skull, our scobbles, our skulls and our cobbles, and max that in. Here we just brought in that mortar layer. That whole graph that represents all of the mortar we built earlier in the earlier in the graph. So you could literally just max these on top of each other. Now, it doesn't look great. It's not super nice, right? The skulls are kind of hiding under the stone. They don't really interact with it in a way that makes a ton of sense. It looks okay, and 
some stuff might look a little bit like that, but it's not great. So what we did instead is I focused on punching out holes in the mortar for where those skulls will be. And the way we made those holes is was to just take the cobblestones, the scobblestones, blur them, slope blur them, auto level them. I'm just making a shape of where they are and then just punching that out from the mortar first. And the reason for all of these um, different, like you could just take this, just blur the scobble map and just straight up subtract it. The problem is it's really blobby and gross. It doesn't look very good. And if you were to look at it here, you'd think like, okay, well, what are we doing? Right? They're kind of just like in a soft little position here. But taking the the blurred scobble mask and doing some math, through, like even just slope blurring it with the layer underneath, this is a cool trick, right? You take that mortar layer and use it as a slope blur, set to blur here. And this immediately makes it better because at least the the holes we're punching out follow the kind of contours of that initial height map. Then we did a bunch more stuff that we auto leveled it, um, made it a bit more sharp, right? So it was either really strong or really weak. Auto leveled that. And all we're really trying to do here is kind of create these little sinkholes for them. And once we have those holes punched out, we're able to lay our skulls in in cobblestones or scobblestones. And in this does a really good job of having them kind of like nest in there. And it's cool because we, we end up having these layering effects where we have mortar and then cobblestone and then more mortar and then skull. Like it's not, sometimes you'll see a lot of designer materials, like especially people that are starting new, where it's just like thing one, thing two, thing three. And they're always in that order, A, B, then C. But here we have it like kind of mixing, right? Because here we have mortar and then we go to cobble, but then we go back to mortar, right? So this mortar is sometimes below this cobble but also sometimes above it and we get that by having kind of that interesting layering already in this material as we were focused on building just the mortar and then subtracting stuff from it and blending it back on we get these really cool interactions between the layers which adds a lot more believability it's a lot more just interesting to look at in the first place what's a win-win-win after this i wanted to add some pebbles in here and so Again, it makes sense to me to just focus on making the pebbles to begin with. Now, obviously, these are really um, high just because they're very bright, very dark. They eventually get leveled down. But just like we focus on making just the mortar layer on its own and just the cobblestones on its own, we want to do the same thing with the pebbles here. So I just grabbed a cells, really zoomed it in. So it's really high frequency. Right? These should be a lot smaller than the cobblestones because it's just the pebbles they're made out of. Did a history scan of this, like beveled it, made some little pebbles here. Thought they were a little too round, so we just have some flood fills set up to flood fill to random gradient to just cut some edges off, right? So this blend mode is set to min, and this is helpful for just adding additional plane changes. And I think we stacked two of them on top of each other. And then we have this flood fill to random grayscale that we're using a histogram scan on in order to just cut some of the pebbles out so that they're not everywhere. And then here, this is the exact same chain as this, but these pebbles are larger. This noise is like 117. It's pretty zoomed out. This noise is a lot more zoomed out at 196, right? So there, it's a lot, these, these pebble zones, there should be a lot more of them and they'll be a lot more frequent. So I put these on here. Now we have a nice mix of stuff, like really small stones and some much bigger ones. And then the complicated thing, here we just added a little bit of detail to them. Right, so they weren't so boring. They have like some surface detail on them. And it's really just like a black and white spots getting subtracted onto it just so that they have a bit more detail and they're not like a really clean stone because the whole texture is pretty, pretty beat up. The interesting stuff here was blending these cobblestones on because just like everything else with the skulls and the cobbles, it's pretty difficult to just like blend this directly on to our height map with like a max blending mode. 
this doesn't work great. Mostly because it's hard for us to find a level where we want them, right? Like if I took the stones and made them brighter, they'll start showing up because the max blending only shows the brighter of the two values. But this only allows them to show up in basically the darkest areas of this height map, which makes sense, right? You're using a max blending mode. But I wanted to make it so that they could actually show up in more places. Like basically, I wanted them to show up in the concave areas of the texture where the angle is, like this really tight angle, right? So we made a flood fill of all the cobbles just using a normal map to create a curvature sobo, scanning it, get a good mask to plug into a flood fill. And what we're doing here is making a flood fill to grayscale, two flood fills to grayscale. The first one, we're plugging an actual curvature map of the, the texture up to this point, right? So this is like the skulls and the cobblestones in the mortar. Normal map, make a curvature. We grab the concavity, right? So these are the concave areas of the texture where we have like an, an angle change that's really, really severe. It's like a crevice, right? So we take this, plug it into the flood fill to grayscale. And what this does is it makes those cobbles that occur, that happen to occur along where the concave areas are, it makes them brighter. So we take that and screen it on. And what that does is it's going to boost those cobblestones up so that they're more likely to show up in the crevice here. So I can just reroute that here to show you what I mean. We'll take this. Like here. So you can see I was able to get the stones to more just kind of show up wherever there's these concave areas. Right, where we have a really big angle change. And the way we're able to do that, this these kind of controls here control the overall height of the pebbles, right? So that the higher this position goes, the more pebbles we should see because they're just generally higher. Right? This blend acts as a boost to boost up how likely they are to appear in these concave areas. Right, so if we turn this down, it'll go back to how it was before. We don't really get a chance to see them because they only show up in the darkest parts of that height map because of the max blending mode. So this is a really good way of just boosting these up so that we can see more of them, but we're not increasing the height of the ones that are down low. It only increases the heights of the ones in the areas where we want them to be increased. And then we had another uh, node here where we're using the overall height map to make them shorter. And this is just because if we don't do this, what we can have is a situation where, sure, we have the stones everywhere, right? The pebbles definitely are everywhere. But the problem is they're so bright that they're showing up on top of the cobbles. And they're all kind of of a uniform height, which doesn't feel very great, right? If you were to look at this from the side. So taking a flood field to grayscale for these pebbles and plugging in a height map does a pretty good job of when you multiply this, just sizing these all down so that they more conform to the height map, right? They're better able to... Um, be lower in the areas that the height map is lower and be higher in the areas where the height map is higher. So a way you can think of it, basically, probably an easier way to see it, is if you grab a tile generator, grayscale, and you make whatever, a disk here, and we blur it a little bit, with something like this. And we blend this on top of like a crystal or something. We imagine this crystal as our height map. This doesn't look so great because it doesn't matter how big the or how um, low or high the height map is. Even if a little if a guy shows up at like the, the top here, or he shows up in one of the the valleys they're the same height, right? We want these to be a different color 
based on the height map beneath them. So you could use a tile sampler. We couldn't in this case because we didn't start from a tile sampler. So what I decided to do instead, wait, we'll put this stuff over here for a minute. because I, I do think this thing is worth just highlighting here. What I decided to do instead was say, okay, well, let's grab a flood fill of these shapes we're blending on. And then a flood fill to grayscale. And plug in our height map. And now they're going to become the same color as the height map beneath them. Which is great because it allows us to modulate these. So if we just multiply this, this is more realistic. So they're going to get lower if they show up in low points and stay higher if they show up in high points. Right? So they more conform to the height map underneath them. You can see here. Right? This one is much taller than this one because he shows up higher on the texture. So I think that's a really great way of kind of blending those, those pebbles in in a, in a more uh, intelligent way. Then after that, we did this a, a very similar thing uh, after the pebbles with sand. So this just lays on a really high frequency rock. These little guys. And it's a very similar trick where we're, we're using the height map to make them brighter in certain areas and darker in certain areas so that they conform to the height map, just like what we did with the example a second ago. The cool thing about this is because this is going to be a wall, we want all these little tiny stones. They shouldn't show up on the undersides of rocks. Right? They shouldn't be clinging to them. Right? You'll notice that they only show up on the tops. Same with the skulls. Right? None show up in here. And the way we're doing that is by taking our normal map, the green channel of the normal map will show you faces that are oriented towards the bottom of the texture or towards the top, right? Where the angles are. So white in the green channel is oriented towards the bottom of the normal map and black is pointing towards the top in, in V, in the vertical direction. So if I grab that, invert it, now we have the reverse, right? We have white facing the top, black facing the bottom. And then I scanned that and use that as the mask for laying on these you know, tiny little fine pebbles, they only show up on the top faces. So without this mask, you'll see the pebbles show up everywhere. Right? They're kind of like static clinging to the bottom of all these rocks, which if you're making a floor, this is probably fine, right? But if this is going to go on the wall or something, this doesn't make a ton of sense for them to fight gravity like that. So this mask does a really good job of taking them away and only focusing them on the faces that point up. It's a nice little detail. Then the last thing we did to kind of finish our height map off, I may have made this frame impossibly small <laughs> by accident. The last thing we did was add like a really high grain sand. And so this is really quick. We just made like a super almost white noise really. And we laid this over top to get our final height map. And we did something very similar with the sand. We just wanted it. And you can see all those sparkles from the roughness map, which we'll, we'll go over. Same thing. We used a mask to blend them so they only show up uh, on the tops, just like the pebbles. And that was the height map. So it's not, it's not too bad, actually. Doing the color is very easy because we've made ourselves a ton of interesting details and textures just in the other channels, right? The normal map and the height map have so much kind of interesting stuff in them to begin with that making those albedo textures is actually fairly simple because we have a lot to draw on. Um, so I'm going to make a temporary guy here so that we can look at the albedo and stages. And the way I like to make the albedo is very much like the roughness or very much like the height. I want to work in stages here. So we focused on making just the mortar first. And for that, we're just going to start with, um, we'll go to mortar or temporary mortar. I just start with flat colors every time. So I picked a color that I thought would work fairly well with the, I'm just going to compute the thumbnails here so we can see them all. 
Just take a second. This grab is a little heavy. I'm not on the mo the strongest machine known to man either. One eternity later. Okay, now that they've loaded. Here, I'm just starting with flat colors every time. And we're going to do these one layer at a time. This is just the whole mortar level. So really, it's a very similar to the height map where we're just layering on, in this case, some different colors, like the pink is really subtle, making some fun noises. Occasionally, we're drawing it from the height map itself. So we're using a normal map here, running that into a vector morph just to create some more interesting noises that are tied to the height map, right? Whether you're using directional warps or vector morphs, something to just relate them more to the height map underneath them. And this is just adding more breakup one after another. We're just slowly layering on some some kind of local color changes, some different different hues in there. We got these like a really dark kind of blue we wanted to slap on. And then doing things like adding some curvature. Um, this is so that we had this kind of whiter highlight along the edges. So we took the normal map, used a curvature smooth, and pulled the, the concavity out, convexity rather, scanned it. And this is these white areas along the mortar is sort of where like someone's kicked it or dragged the sword across the wall or something and knocked off material that's older and more oxidized and exposed some newer stone underneath that's fresher. And you'll see at the end of each of these albedo channels, I also have a master level. So in here, I can just tweak the overall hue and saturation of the mortar itself. We want to just quickly see what it looks like altered. And same thing with um, the, the uh, master level here. This is kind of a cool like patina look, right? Um, this allows me to just really quickly adjust things. If I decide, you know what, this needs to be, it's too colorful, I need to desaturate it a little, or maybe I want to go take the blues out because they're a little too blue. Um, it allows me to just wiggle around um, these kind of final, uh, the, everything that comes before them. Then we moved to the actual cobblestones. There's some fun stuff here on the cobbles. We wanted to take um, some random, we actually took some scan data here. So this is from Mega Scans, just some cobblestone we liked. We blurred it, ran it through gradient dynamic with a flood fill to random grayscale. This is where all the cobbles are. And so if we plugged it into here, we're actually able to get like a separate tone on each of the cobblestones. Might be a little hard to see, so I'll plug in the last one here when the cobblestones get blended on. And where they get blended on here, basically we take our mortar and we take our cobblestones and we blend them into each other. So you'll see every once in a while I have these height masks. That comes from just taking the separate elements out. Right? I made a whole video on height mask extraction, but you're often just like subtracting the two things from each other. Um, so for instance, down here, I wanted a mask of where the pebbles are. Right? These are all those that fine pebbles that we laid on here. To get that mask, you just take the end result and subtract the input, one of them. And this gives you the difference between the two textures, which is where the pebbles are. We basically took pebbles plus a background height map and subtracted just the pebbles from it. And so that gives us where they're different. So you'll see I've made all these height masks all over the place. And I would reference that video or go to Patreon and watch the entire you know, eight hour run through. But you'll see I make these all the time, pull just the skulls out, pull, pull just the cobbles, uh, cobbles out. And here I'm doing just the same to blend our cobblestone texture on with our mortar. In this mortar section, or the cobblestone section rather, it looks very much the same. We're just slowly adding more variation, more noises, right, to make these cobbles more interesting. Working from kind of high frequency to low frequency, a lot of these are just set to add sub, where I'm just making, uh, taking a noise um, and making the white areas a little bit brighter, and the dark areas a little bit darker, just trying to shift the tones around, get some more interesting uh, luminance value breakup going along on the cobbles. And in some cases, we're actually doing a lot of different color stuff, right? Blending in a whole other color, um, just trying to get more detail into these stones. But you can see, like, you can hopefully you're seeing how 
this seems complicated, but it really isn't. When you just layer on these details slowly, you build complexity gradually. It's like very common to work like this. And then we blend them on. We have this nice, and again, we have master cobble levels here. So we can take the overall cobbles and say, you know what, they got to be darker, right? And just adjust them at this kind of like really high level, which works really, really well. After that, we did the skulls. So if we just put these, I decided I wanted to make these a little bit of a warmer tone, just to contrast with uh, the kind of co relatively cooler tones of the, the mortar and the cobbles. We're, like they'll all get kind of unified by some dirt and stuff later so i'm not super worried about them stand at this point they will likely look to you that they stand out a little too much but they'll get kind of blended in with each other as we as we texture them but this should be similar now we are looking at the reference here and finding this kind of like rusty look this that looks really neat it's like kind of just dirty grimy and i like the kind of red warmer tones of this so we just made a fun texture here, right? So this is just like a moisture noise. It's high passed a bit, vector morph, slope blurred, just beating it up a bit, running it through a gradient map where we picked some fun reds from the reference, right? You can take this gradient and just run this on stuff. And we decided to run that over our reference being fairly selective because I don't want, a lot of people are a little too heavy hand with the gradient, uh, the gradient map and they just zigzag that all over it photo reference and it gets really spiky right there's lots of really dark values lots of really bright values it's really noisy and the end result isn't very good so we lay that on lay on more noise we tinted the skull so some are a little bit darker than others some are a little brighter than others put on some curvature like some really fine tight curvature right like hugging the edge immediately and that's like just where they've just been like scraped and bumped and I like having the curvature separate per layer. A lot of people will lay the, not a lot of people, I guess, but I've seen people have one curvature right at the end on top of the whole albedo. You can, and I do it a little bit to sharpen some details, but I much prefer to have the curvatures completely different per uh, element of the texture so that I can control them separately because the curvature should probably be a little bit different on the cobbles versus the skulls versus the pebbles. So we get down to the pebble albedo. And this is where we launched all of our pebbles on. And what was fun about this is we used that same scan data earlier, the one we downloaded of those cobblestones to just make a palette here so that all of our pebbles would be a slightly different hue and tone here. So some are darker, some are a bit more red. And to do that, we just did a flood fill of our pebbles, did a flood fill to random grayscale, ran it through that gradient map, and then just blended it on top. Really simple. We did a very similar thing with the fine grain sand as well. So that adds a lot of variety. So instead of all of these little stones being the same color, we're able to get all these kind of interesting different hues and values here, right? Which adds just a ton of believability to the final texture. Sand was really simple. It's basically a flat color, wherever the sand was that we broke up with a little bit of noise. Right, so that was a bit more choppy, really, really crunchy. It should be, it's sand, it's really tiny grains. So you can see even in the albedo, we've done a similar thing where we've worked from like really big colors and slowly worked to smaller shapes um, and smaller frequency, like higher frequency change in colors. And as you blend all these things onto each other, you do really get to see that kind of complexity emerge. The dirt was really simple. At the end of the day, it's mostly an AO. So we took an AO of our height map, inverted it because we want the dirt in the cracks, not on the tops, and then did a levels to kind of push the AO higher in the cracks. And the albedo for the dirt is really simple. It's basically just like a big noisy brown texture. You could just do a flat color, right? We originally started with just a totally flat color. It's a little bit less interesting, right? We would rather have something that's not just a totally flat value. It's, it's a bit more interesting, a bit more breakup. Something that's, it's, it's about these kind of subtle ads, right? That really do make a big difference to the end result. 
And that was the albedo. The last thing we did is just add like a little curvature sobel on an add sub mode, just to kind of pop all those details out a tiny bit. It's very low intensity. You could probably make it lower if you wanted to, but it just kind of punches the last bit of detail up. And at this point, if you had this much done on the albedo, you would want to turn the AO down because you want to see more of the actual albedo texture unaffected by the AO. And then it was on to roughness. And this was very simple. We really just, in the same way with albedo and height, you generally tend to think of like general changes that are non-specific. They're not really an observed thing from the reference. It's just like a base layer of interest. In this case, I used a moisture noise just to create a basic level of variety of noise in the roughness. So some areas a bit rougher, some areas a bit smoother. And then we're adding in specific details. And we approach this similarly to the albedo where we're doing it in sections, doing the mortar first. And then we laid on the cobbles and then all the fine uh, noise, like the fine pebbles and all of the masks we're getting to build the roughness map because we've done a bunch of albedo texturing, because we've done a bunch of height texturing and normal map stuff. We have a ton of masks to draw from to actually pump in these specific details. So you can see here, this is a ton of the masks we used to texture the cobbles. I've just pulled some of those masks off into an RGBA merge node and sent them down to the roughness. I've done that all here, right? Here's the roughness masks, a one, right? This is just from the, the mortar specifically. Here's the roughness masks for the cobbles specifically, for the pebbles. And I'm able to just pull from those down here. I right? grab the mortar masks, pull them out, have them all separated, and just decide, hey, where that stone got more pink, let's make it a bit smoother, right? And you wouldn't want these to be mega intense, right? Like right now, it gets really wet here, right? So it's often just pulling these back until you can't really feel them. I definitely wanted, um, for instance, on the mortar, the edges to be way rougher because it's just like more worn down. You could do the reverse though. I could have subtracted this and that would make the edges of the mortar a lot shinier because maybe there's just like newer stone that's less, you know, affected by the wear and dust and sand and stuff. So it's a bit more beaten up, but you have a lot of options and we have master levels to just kind of control the overall layer. Like the mortar roughness, we could say, hey, I want it to be the mortar to be a lot more smooth. We just lower that master control, just like we had the master controls in the albedo. And that's essentially it for the roughness. What this it's it's cool to have these kind of master controls in the roughness and the albedo, because it makes it much easier to go back and do that look development towards the end. But that's basically it here. That's a really kind of high level overview of this. Um you're going to get through a phase here at some point where you have everything in like we have here, but we've made all these master controls for us and you can go back and look dev this, go back and say, you know what? The sand is too bright. Let's make that a, a bit darker, more like dirt. You, this, the skulls seem a little too red. So you can go to the red channel, pull it down and you're going to, now they're like too green for sure, but you're going to go through this process for sure of just going through when you're done doing reps, just rebalancing everything. You go back to the height map, change stuff, change the height of pebbles, add more or less, um, and just arrive at the texture that you're interested in. Um, it very much is this case where you build everything out, make it feel nice and it's working well, but you leave yourself all these little controls. So at the end, you can do this polish pass going through and adjusting all those layers. And so there we go. A really good kind of high level overview of how I approach this whole material, kind of my thought processes and some of the interesting steps along the way. Again, if you're more interested in a like node by node, real time, again, eight hours of content, you can go on the Patreon and look at the actual real time rebuild of the entire material. It's a lot. So it's in several sections because there's just so much we cover. If you go give me a follow there, that'd be great. I really appreciate the support. It helps me be able to create more stuff like this, more longer form stuff. If people really like this kind of thing, I'll definitely be building more similar things where we do like complete run throughs with a lot more kind of hand holding and explanation of the steps along the way. I share everyone's frustrations when you're trying to learn a new thing and people kind of do speed, you know, time lapses through things or they assume a ton of different information is already understood. That can be a problem. It certainly is for me if I'm learning a new thing. 
So I think this kind of resource can be really valuable um, when you're trying to get that kind of first step in. So I'd appreciate if you go check that out. If you like the video, be sure to like the video. Uh, and if you like the video a lot, you could subscribe and hit that bell so you get a notification when the videos you like come out so you can see the new ones when they, when they arrive. Um, but thank you for the time today, everyone. I appreciate everyone coming to hang out for a bit. And hopefully you learned something, added a new trick or tool or a little bit of knowledge to your toolkit. Uh, and we will see you guys in the next one.